Uh, we'll continue our march on the rotator cuff. Okay, we talked about this on a, a loose anchor. All right. Jason, what do you think of this one? We have a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon retracted almost to the glenoid ring. Uh, John, can you hear okay? I guess not. John? Yes. You can hear okay. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, looks like a full thickness uh, supraspinatus tear with retraction and uh, superior migration of the humeral head. Okay, anything else? Um, this patient had surgery. Oh, this patient had surgery. What's this? Oh, there's some. That, that's not a bullet. That's the not a bullet. anchor, huh? Okay. And here, actually, here is the side of the, where the anchor was put in. And here we can see the anchor back here. And so that was a displaced suture anchor. Okay. For me? Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, I'm seeing dark signal. I think it's gonna be near the foot plate at the, on that coronal view, but on the axial view, are we posterior? Well, this is a low field scanner. These are T1 weighted images and the tendon should be dark on T1 weighted image, but it looks like this is darker than normal, though you guys haven't seen too many images from this particular scanner. So you'd like to ask for a plain film if you have it. And here's what the plain film looks like. Sure, we see some uh, calcification there. Um, so this is usually called calcific tendonitis. Though tendonitis really implies that there is inflammatory changes. And generally, if you have inflammatory changes, you're going to see edema on an MR. And so sometimes we will see a lot of edema around the calcification, but not always. But that's still kind of a term that's used, or calcific tendinopathy, or CPPT disease, or HAD disease. So there are a lot of different names for this. Uh, and it's basically calcium hydroxyapatite deposition, and those are the kind of crystals you typically see within these if you actually take it out and do crystallography on it. Uh, the biochemistry here is a, a little bit complicated, uh, and they end up with matrix calcifications, either CPPT or uh, HA crystals. Uh, and I think this is kind of complete, not completely understood how this occurs, but I think that uh, like in many areas we see elsewhere in the body, uh, you can get, and we followed it over time with MR in some cases, you get uh, injury to the tendon, usually kind of an interstitial partial tear with or without hemorrhage, and that induces a healing response, and in that you can sometimes get calcium deposits in that area. So I think that this is predominantly associated with degenerative disease and traumatic injury to the tendon. Uh, if you follow these, these commonly will resorb on their own, in which case often the symptoms will resolve. Uh, so I do believe that the uh, calcification process itself is often associated with inflammatory disease, uh, but that inflammatory disease may go away before the calcium uh, is resorbed. And it's usually uh, followed by, it's a phagocystic type resorption uh, when the absorption occur. It doesn't have to, but the vast majority of calcific tendinopathy that we have followed over time, the calcium is resorbed usually within three to six months, but sometimes it can stay longer. Uh, some people believe that it's most painful during the resorption phase. You know, I haven't done enough studies of patients where I really have had the patient symptoms to, to confirm that. To me, it would seem to make more sense that usually early on we see 
inflammatory change and edema associated with these, and more chronically you don't, uh, I would be, I would think that the pain would really be more associated with the associated edema, but not necessarily. So that I still think that's not completely been worked out. Uh, and here's just basically a timeline that some people say kind of occurs with this. You get formative chains and here's, they say pain with or without pain. Resting, you may or may not have pain. Here they think that it's a resorptive phase that's the most painful. And then you have post calcific area where you can have pain or not, and then you can end up with a normal tendon. Uh, despite the fact that this is a very common finding, which you've all seen over and over again, uh, I'm surprised that uh, yeah, it seems like there's still a lot of kind of unknowns in the pathophysiology and the time course of this particular disease. Some people will aspirate these, and here we can see the milk of calcium in the bottom of this aspiration from a patient with uh, uh, calcific tendinopathy. Uh, John, uh, uh, how do you well, typically well, treat this? When I, um, I use this uh, uh, anesthetized area with uh, lidocaine and, uh, and then use a small needle to do that, uh, like a 30 gauge or a 32 two gauge, the smallest one you can get to anesthetize the skin and then go into the area of uh, interest um, and try to get um, some of the calcium out if I can. If not, doesn't really make any difference. Inject cortisone into the area and uh, and and puncture the area several times um, so that you, uh, if you hit an area that's a little um, uh, firmer than 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 chalk, um, you want to make sure you break up the small fragments of uh, calcium. Uh, the, the, the range of calcification is interesting because some of it is like water and some of it is um, as hard as like chalk, chalk. So depending on what you find, that's how you, you that, that, that treatment is the same. You still inject cortisol. And then that has the quick, quickest way to get rid of the problem. First day after the injection, it won't be very pleasant, but uh, the second, third day, your, your pain is pretty much gone if you hit the right spot. Thank you, John. Good. Uh, and I, my, my sense of this over the years is uh, this used to be treated more aggressively than it is now. I think now it's often treated uh, uh, less aggressively th than in the past. But uh, here's just a European League against rheumatism technology, and they, they, they claim that most but not all of uh, calcific tendonitis is actually uh, calcium pyrophosphate dehydrate crystal deposition. Uh, great. So I, I think that there's, it's, there's still a lot of debate upon the appropriate treatment. Well, uh, the, the, the thing is... Uh... Uh, when a patient comes to my office and it's in severe pain, um, yep. you see calcium in people all, all the time, uh, but they're not having, uh, that's an incidental finding most times. Yep. But if they come in with a very tender shoulder and they're screaming with pain, I yep. treat it. Good. Yeah, that makes sense. So there's a the Question about whether uh, rotator cuff tears are more commonly seen if in patients with calcific tendinopathy than otherwise. This is a paper where they kind of looked at that. They found no increased incidence of cuff tears in patients with calcific tendinopathy. And they felt that the calcific tendinopathy probably arises from different pathologic process than rotator cuff tears. We know that rotator cuff tears really are associated with... Uh, tendinosis and partial tears. Uh, so this would imply that tendinosis and partial tears are not associated with calcific tendinopathy, but uh, I don't think that there's really firm evidence to, to prove that. Well, by taking history of my patients, I, I never got that impression that 
severe trauma had occurred, um, mostly it was pe active people that I've seen. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think it's severe trauma, right? They're just like uh, most rotator cuff tears are not associated with severe trauma. Right. I agree then with that. Yeah. And I have treated hundreds of these, so it's, it's not an unusual problem. All right, so we got two coronals, uh, just a few globular foci have decreased signal. Looks looks like it's in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Uh, there's some looks like there's some tendinosis of the underlying tendon as well, but it looks like yeah. it's intact. So what would you call this? I, I think I'd go with a calcific bursitis. Or... Yeah, I would call this calcific bursitis. This is tendonitis, but calcific bursitis, or this this could even be a uh... Uh, the bursa would be inflamed and you would have more fluid. Um, this is just calcium. Well, you see a lot of thickening of the... Yeah, the, 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 that's because that's a chronic inflammation. Yeah, this could also that's be... Also, this could also be osteochondromatosis. So I think there are a number of possibilities for this. Uh, these are probably less likely to resorb rapidly than than the calcification within the tendon. So these were often removed surgically, like you know, as... Whenever I've seen osteochondromatosis, John, it yeah. um, has been mainly in the knee, but uh, I, I may have seen a case or two in the shoulder, I can't remember. Yeah. But it comes into... Uh, Bunches of uh, uh, nodules, not not just um, globs of nodules like you see here. Well, the, the, I think we'll get into it later. Uh, at least we certainly will when we get into the tumor uh, lectures later. Okay. There are uh, several types of osteochondromatosis and just synovial chondromatosis. Uh, right. Depending on whether they calcify or not. Uh, uh, once uh, you have innumerable ones, and I've seen it, by, it's infrequent, but not rare in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And I've seen them before they're calcified, when they are calcified. And then a lot of people will use the term osteochondromatosis as two types. One which is probably a metaplastic disease, where you have innumerable ones. And one where you have a few more that are irregular like this, which are kind of thought to be somehow associated with degenerative changes but you get these uh, calcified uh, loose bodies within joints. So, uh, so there's, there's several different varieties. I wonder why this patient waited this. Uh, this obviously is a chronic problem. Right. Um, and the patient didn't get treated for a long time. Uh, I don't know. I, right. Probably the pain was gone. I don't know. Yeah. Or do you have a different history on it? So, 57 year old female with intermittent shoulder pain for several years after a body surfing injury, 48 hours of acute intense pain after yoga, rule out rotator cuff tear. Um, so, it looks like there is a, it's like a focal hypo intense, hypo intensity there at the um at the insertion um is that it looks like it's too far far posteriors is that the infraspinatus um, or maybe we're seeing the sagittal imaging this this is the i think we're getting close to the core cord process here i think we're anterior anterior in this cut so is it uh so we've had that... intermittent pain for several years after body surfing injury and then severe pain right after doing yoga. So what do you think is associated with the pain here? What would you call this? Um, looks like it looks like the intense, uh, hypointense. Oh, so that's, um, that's at the subscapular. Oh, uh, yeah. So the hypointense signals at the insertion of the subscapularis. Um, so it looks like it's calcium. So, and there's edema in the... Yeah, there's a lot of edema. In the bursa as well as in the surrounding muscles here. So this is calcific tendonitis. Yeah, so this kind of 
That's an extremely sensitive area, so that is very, very painful. Yeah. So the uh, so the, this they elected to treat it like kind of uh, non-surgical, and you, and uh, the pain went away over six weeks with non steroidals and physical therapy, and uh, she uh, refused. Uh, uh, any sort of interventional procedure, even though our interventional radiologist really wanted to do this, and I remember. And then here, this is uh, 14 months later. Uh, she was asymptomatic, but we brought her back just to see what it looked like. What do you think? Uh, 14 months later. So 14 months later, it looks like uh, the previously noted calcification at the uh, tendon insertion looks like it's pretty much resolved. Yeah, and the edema is resolved. Maybe I should give a lecture on pathology in my family. Uh, uh, well, you're doing a good job right now. <laughs> right, exactly. All right. I, I remember... Uh... I offered my services, but uh, you did. Uh, it would have been a very simple procedure to do. She wanted nothing to do with needles or knives. So it looks like we have. I don't remember whether you were involved in this at all, or much. So in our radiograph, it looks like we have a focus of calcium. Deposition then over the uh, supraspinatus fossa uh, with a uh, low signal focus, kind of within the bone, right? Yeah, with some uh, heterogeneity of the tendon. Well, what would you call this? Still looks like a. Yeah. Okay, erosive. So, okay, you can get erosive changes with these, and I I think the changes are, you know, it looks like they could be mechanical, but I really think the changes here are more the inflammation surrounding this, which is, I think, somehow part of the process early on, and these, <coughs> and you can see there's extensive bone marrow edema, in this uh, case also. Um, so this is a erosive calcific tendonitis. If you look at it on the x-ray, John, it does not show a little lucency in the greater tuberosity area. That Yeah, so there's kind of lucency in here. There's an erosion there. The lucency on the radiograph is the same area where we get edema on the MR. So I think what you have to hear is you have osteitis, and that osteitis is actually resorbing the trabecular bone in this area. We'll talk more about bone pathophysiology. We'll have a bone lecture, and we'll talk about erosions and how erosions occur and uh, uh, later this year. And But when you get osteitis within the bone, that inflammatory disease actually dissolves the trabecular bone, which is one of the reasons why you need to diagnose and treat rheumatoid arthritis very rapidly now, so you stop this process before you destroy, irreversibly destroy the trabecular bone. We'll have a whole lecture about that later. So this area of lucency is the same area where you see the edema, uh, though MR is much more sensitive for bone edema than X-rays. The X-rays, you have to have bone edema for an extended period of time to actually dissolve the trabecular bone, whereas with MR, we can pick up the edema uh, very early in the course, and that'll be important when we give our lectures about rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. okay, so here we see low signal in the infraspinatus tendon fibers. So again, calcific tendonitis, probably. With erosive changes. Right? Erosion, yeah. And this is on a low field scanner, 0.2 Tesla scanner. Okay. All right, so we have a 70 year old with severe shoulder pain. Uh, again, kind of at the insertion of the supraspinatus. There's a lot of low signal there. 
Yeah, it's, it's really a lot of inhomogeneous signal. You know, mm -hmm. you could say maybe this is normal tendon, but it's very irregular, which is not normal. But then you have a lot of higher signal intensity than normal tendon around it, but it's very model type appearance, mm -hmm. right? And then here on the PD fat set, we can see that there's a lot of edema in the soft tissues, yep. especially associated with the bursa out here. If we go to the sagittal images, what do you see here? Uh, looks like. Kind of looking at the supraspinatus, there's a lot of edema and some decreased signal. Edema there, and then you see a lot of edema through yeah. here. So what do you want to look, what do you want to see next? Uh, maybe a CT. Oh my gosh, a CT. So there's the CT. How does that help you? Uh, looks like there's a lot of, I guess, calcification in there. Yeah. So this can have extensive disease. It can even go into the muscle. Okay. Okay, great. So we have a 45 year old female, shoulder pain, no trauma. We have a plain film of the uh, left shoulder. Uh, looks like there's a calcific density or possible osseous fragment there on the um, posterior or the. Um, what do you think about the bone? Yeah, there's a regular kind of like, um, I don't know if you call those rings and arcs or. They look, yeah, well, look like there's some well, a lot of inhomogeneous density here, but you're right, it could be rings and arcs. Uh, here's the MR scan. So we have two coronal views. Um, looks like there's increased signal within the uh, supraspinatus tendon, so there's probably some tendinosis. A little bit there. Right? You know, not seeing that little oscillate projection very well, I and mean, we have this area in through here. Could be hematopoietic marrow, but you know it's really sharply defined, and probably not. So we have a T1. There's the so T1 T1 post. That's that post. Okay. So it looks like there's some enhance, maybe some enhancement. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have a T1 fat set pre, so we can't call it enhancement. Okay. Uh, remember, never call enhancement unless you have an identical pre-sequence to post-sequence to show there's a difference because there's a tremendous difference in tissue contrast when you fat suppress a T1-weighted image. But here on the T1 image, this is clearly abnormal low signal intensity, which is not normal in the same area where we have high signal intensity. This turned out to be an enchondroma in a patient who uh, had erosive uh, calcific tendinopathy. All right. So I see a focus of low signal kind of deep to the subscapularis tendon right there. You're talking about this? Yeah. What do you think of that? Uh, that is um, edema within the tendon. Okay, so it's high signal intensity on these T2 weighted images. There's some more images in that particular okay, area. Still some that increasing substance. substance signal, yeah. And then uh, uh, this this just shows this is one of the reasons. I, as you guys all know, I'm not a fan of arthrography uh, of the shoulder, except in rare situations with young athletes. Uh, but I personally wouldn't do an MRI, wouldn't recommend an MRI arthrogram without a, a plain MR first, but uh, uh, there are a lot of sports medicine radiologists, especially those of my age that grew up during arthrography who would severely disagree with me there. But <clears throat> with modern MR techniques, uh, I, I don't think that arthrography adds a lot. Uh, some of the early papers said it did, but that was before we had current quality imaging. <clears throat> Uh, once you put in the contrast, there, you're no longer dealing with the physiologic situation, so there are a lot of things you can't evaluate, such as it becomes less, more difficult to evaluate for frozen shoulder and adhesive capsulitis, which is a very common diagnosis, as you guys all know, because you often inject right in the area of the, uh, of the uh, rotator cuff interval. Uh, and you also distend the capsule 
and often you get extravasation of contrast. And if, especially if it's a young athlete and you're in an area where you have uh, worried about muscle strains as well, then it can be very confusing uh, if you see a, a contrast extravasation to muscle and you're concerned about muscle tears. So I personally am not a big fan. Uh, this was just the injection, not a tear. Uh, uh, this is a superior insertion of the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. I think we talked about that uh, variant of anatomy. No, we didn't. Okay, we will. We will. That's probably coming up in the next few lectures. And that was just a injection. So this is a paper that talked about subscapularis tears. Going into that area now, uh, there the. Uh, the subscapularis tendon has often been divided into four segments. Uh, the first segment is superiorly, and then the second, third, and fourth. Uh, and you don't always clearly see these delineated on an MR examination. Uh, they're, they're typically not in color on an MR examination like they are here. Uh, uh, but by far the most common area and where most tears start is up in the upper uh, insertion, which you've, you've all seen now. It's commonly associated with biceps uh, pathology, which we'll talk about later in a, another lecture. Uh, in the old days, it was called a hidden, hidden lesion because you can't see it arthroscopically, you can't see it arthrographically. Uh, but when MR came along, we can see it very nicely with MR. And it was a common cause of anterior shoulder pain uh, that was difficult to diagnose uh, before the, the pre-MR days. But we'll talk about that in greater detail. And this just shows uh, uh, the different areas. I don't want to go into this in too much detail. Uh, just remember that tears typically start right up here in this corner, and then they progress inferiorly until you get a complete tear. So that's the normal progression of tears of the sub subscapularis tendon. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> these small little tears at the top, in this article they felt that they weren't uh, surgical candidates, but if you're in the presence of a severe tendinopathy of the biceps tendon, especially if you have subluxation of the biceps tendon, this can be a very painful lesion. And uh, 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 there was a very well-known uh, NFL quarterback a number of years ago uh, who had shoulder pain, severe shoulder pain for the last three years of his uh, career and he uh, came to see a local orthopedic surgeon uh, <clears throat> and they, they treated it conservatively because there people really didn't see a major uh, rotator cuff tear or really anything to operate on. Uh, in his last season, right before he played in the Super Bowl, he felt a pop in his shoulder and all of a sudden his pain went away and he played the best game of his life in his last game when he won the Super Bowl. And he came back to the local surgeon, and the, when the local surgeon told him what happened, he had tendinopathy of the biceps tendon and a little superior subscap tear. And uh, so the, the player asked him why he didn't operate on it. And he said, well, that's too small and so forth. And the guy exploded because the pain had been so bad the last three years and uh, now felt so good after the biceps tore. So this is a very important lesion and when we get to the biceps tendon, we'll talk more about it. So uh, here they're kind of downplaying playing these really type 1 and 2A tears. Uh, but uh, I tell you, if it's associated with biceps disease, especially in athletes who have a lot of anterior shoulder pain, uh, this may be very important for us. Biceps tenodesis is pretty easy to do, which is probably the most important thing here. Uh, <clears throat> But also, it's easy to repair these small little tears of the superior insertion of the subscap, which is what I had. And I believe over about a 10-year period, that was really what was causing most of my pain rather than the supraspinatus tendon tear, which I still have. Okay, uh, who's next? Well, the biceps tendon probably is the culprit in this uh, situation yeah, more than anything. And, and when the guy... Uh, brings the arm back to throw, that, that's really under tension. So um, I, I can understand that uh, uh, popping the tendon 
which is inflamed, probably the biceps tendon, uh, was giving him all these problems for two years, which could have been fixed. Right. So most surgeons I know now in the local area, if they even sniff at uh, biceps tendinopathy, they'll do a tenodesis. Go ahead. Okay, so here we got PD fat set images. Got looking at the subscap distally, I see some edema. Yeah. Oh, okay. Medially, so, there's in the muscle. So that that's a that's a tear. So uh, just remember, especially in these young athletes, know this this is a big athlete, huge huge muscles. Uh, uh, tears of the muscle itself can cause symptoms of the shoulder. Uh, that's rarely in people my age uh, to see the tendons that tear. But not, not, not can, John. It, it will. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. So we have anterior shoulder pain. Uh, looking at that subscap, it looks like there's some tendinosis kind of at the insertion there. Yeah. And, and so this is subscap here, partial tear. Actually, I think this is a patient of reuse. Yeah. In the early days of MR, this was really in the days when we were first doing MR of the shoulder and we were getting a lot of flack by the radiology community saying we we're wasting precious MR resources by doing MRs of joints. Yeah. Okay, so it's like we have a sagittal and axial view. Um, looks like there's a focal increased signal within the subscapularis tendon. It looks like it's it doesn't look like it uh, um, connects with the bursal or looks like it's intersubstance. Yeah. So this is a this is an interstitial partial tear. It's bigger than the one we saw before. So this is a, a bigger uh, partial tear. Tayson. So it looks like we have some uh, under-surface uh, tearing of the subscapularis. Yeah, with a little traction cyst there on the subscap. Yeah, good. Okay, so here I see thickening of that uh, subscap with surrounding subdeltoid bursal fluid. Okay. So here is the subscap coming in through here, right? Mm -hmm. So what's this? Is that the transverse ligament? Right. So, so that's really a cr chronic uh, high-grade partial tear of the transverse ligament with a lot of granulation tissue trying to heal it and with an uh, inflammatory disease then involving the uh, subacromial subdeltoid bursa with bursitis. And so this is really a... Uh, uh, chronic tear of the transverse ligament. The transverse ligament, I don't think we've discussed it, but uh, is actually a continuation of the superficial fibers of the subscap across the top of the intertuberous groove, which attaches over here, and this is a chronic tear. John? Yeah, and I was going to say the subscap has a lot to do with that area. Yep. All right, so we have a couple axials. Looks like there's some tendinosis and high grade partial tearing of that subscap. Right. So this is a uh, higher grade uh, uh, partial tear. Now, it's common to have these interstitial partial tears and even other partial tears associated with these traction cystic changes where they attach, and they probably are associated. Uh, what often will happen is you'll, you'll get a little avulsion injury of the bone here. That makes it, uh, certain fibers of the subscap or other tendons unstable, they'll retract, producing these uh, interstitial tears. So the two are, are highly related. So we have axial views. Um, it looks like, yeah, it looks like there's, um, is that a full thickness tear? Subscap, yeah, there's, yeah, so there's okay. discontinuity of the tendon there with retraction. Okay, good. So when you see this, the other thing you always want to look for, right, is the musculotendinous junction. It's retracted. It should be up here. It's retracted back probably about two centimeters, which goes along with the full thickness tendon here. And there it is. 
That's a, it's a wide insertion. It doesn't. Uh, it, it can be just a, a transversely only a par partial of the part of the tear of, yeah. of yeah. the tendon, not not a complete a tear of the tendon. Well, and in this particular case, I think it was a pretty complete tear because you've got a lot of retraction of the musculotendinous junction. Uh, because of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but you can't get retraction. That's about uh, the, the insertion is about a, uh, a inch inch or so in length. So yeah. half of it can yeah. tear and yeah. come we, down. We go back here. Yeah, it's, there's a pretty big insertion of the subscap here. Right. Yeah, it, it's a large, large area. I've been there many times. Uh, almost all the surgeries we do on shoulders prior to MRI uh, and, and arthroscopy uh, involved uh, the subscap. Thanks, John. A 32-year-old male status pose football injury. Um, I see a little bit of edema in the humeral head. Um, yeah, right in through here, musculotendinous junction is probably retracted a little bit here. If we go to the axial images, what do you think? Axial images. So we have a uh, tear of the subscapularis insertion. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's a young kid. So what you ought to be concerned about. Is it a tendon tear or is, or is it a bone bulge? A lot of bone marrow edema here. Yeah. And this is a little fragment of bone here. And this was a lesser tuberosity avulsion. Okay. If you're concerned about that, the order I recommend a CT scan. Okay. Because that significantly changes the surgical approach if it's a bone avulsion versus a tendon tear. Okay. Okay, looking at the subscap again, there's a lot, a lot of thickening and edema of the tendon. Um, yeah, a lot of irregularity of the bone here as well. Yeah, could it be okay, another sagittal? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So we see a bone fragment in the tendon fibers and prior avulsion. So. There's the x-ray. Again, see yeah. Bone right here. Mm -hmm. So it's another bone portion. In this case, it was chronic. <clears throat> All right. So looking at the subscap, it looks like there's kind of almost another avulsion. Almost? Uh, an avulsion. <laughs> <laughs> This this is a kid. So what do you think that is? Uh, that's that's bone, right? Yeah, I think it's an avulsion. Okay. There's your CT. Yeah. Okay. So for the axial and sagittal views. Uh, it looks like on the axial view, it looks like there's probably at least a complete, it's like a complete tear of the subscapularis with retraction. See? And then on the... Uh, Oscotinous junction is retracted as well. So that goes along with the complete tear here. Looks like there's muscle atrophy at the subscap. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good. So it's more, probably more chronic complete tear. Good. All right. 50-year-old female pain, three years post-op. So I see that there's probably been a subscapularis repair, but I see it. Is it the deep fibers that are torn and retracted? Yeah, so here it looks like the main fibers of the subscap were torn and retracted. The musculotendinous junction is back here. Yeah. You can see a lot of fatty atrophy here out of the, of the subscap. And uh, this was a failure of the 
of the, the construct, and this is scar in situ uh, that developed over that three years with okay. retraction of the tendon. Okay. Okay, so here, looking at the subscap, looks irregular. There's an osseous fragment that's been retracted, medial to the glenoid. Uh, Muscular tendons junctions way back here. Mm -hmm. So that's an avulsion of the lesser tuberosity. Yeah, another chronic avulsion. Mm -hmm. And these can an old can one, one, does that, John? What? That's an old one. Yeah, it's an old one, and these bone these bone ossicles can grow over time mm. so uh, they can become larger as long as they have nourishment yeah. all right so we have a 29 year old male rule out subscapularis tendon tear uh looks like there's an even bigger avulsion of that lesser tuberosity there yeah and then there's one side really here's another side of the there you can see that big bony fragment. Another old one. Okay. So we have sagittal and axial views. Uh, there's a focal high point hits signal at the um, subscapularis. So we, we saw one of these. Yeah, calcific. Like the, the subscap section just showed the pathology. So it's a lot of Okay. Well, probably, and don't you think, John, it would be better to say that there's no inflammation around that glob of calcium, that it's just calcium deposit? Yeah. Okay, so, so, so I'll, I'll today use the term calcific tendinopathy if I do not see edema. If I see edema on the MR, I usually use the term calcific tendonitis. Not okay. But uh, that's just me. Yeah, well, uh, the tendonitis in an area where there's no inflammation doesn't make sense. Right. All right. So, there's definitely something wrong with the subscapularis. I feel like the myotendon in this junction is uh, retracted. Is it involving the upper third of the subscapularis fibers? My great tear. So it looks like there are two tendons there, right? Yeah. And this was a bifid subscapularis tendon, which are quite rare, but they, you can get them. Okay, shoulder pain after trauma. Okay. Looking at the subscap on the sagittal T2, just un pretty unremarkable. Uh, on the PD fat set, I'm, I mean, I'm seeing some edema around the, I think the supraspinatus muscle, but yeah. Oh, okay. So, this is a strain of the subscapular Humoralis <laughs> digastricus of Gruber, <laughs> which is a accessory muscle, which is also quite rare, but this one happens to be torn. Uh, I, I never I found one. That. <laughs> what, John? I never found one because I was never looking for one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so then we get to rotator cuff tear at the last thing here that Dr. Hawkins wanted to know about was the status of the biceps. I think I have a complete other lecture of the biceps. So I think this is, now this is something that I came up with, uh, 23, uh, uh, really back when I was still in Santa Barbara back in the 1990s, where we're looking at a lot of biceps injuries I used a scale from zero to seven. I never published this. Uh, Bennett in arthroscopy came out with a, with, not, I, modified is probably the wrong word here, his own classification of this, which was more in line with what I had, though he, he didn't have seven different grades. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, in arthroscopy. And there are, there are other grading systems for biceps disease. And may, uh, well, well, we'll see. Let, let me go through these and see. Maybe I have them here, but I think I have another lecture of this. But let me go through some of these. Uh, so here we can see the biceps is perched. It's not deep in the inner tuber as well here. We also see that there is a tear of the deep fibers of the subscapularis tendon. And this typically uh, occurs because you get subluxation of the biceps tendon because of a tear of the superior glenohumeral ligament. We talked a little bit about the anatomy of that earlier. And I think we're going to go to it in more detail in a minute or maybe next lecture. And this then it subluxes into the subscapularis tendon, where it then can tear its way through the deep fibers and end up within the joint. Uh, so that just shows instability. Uh, yeah, and I, so I, I think I have a whole lecture where I'm going to go through this in much more detail. So uh, that, that's just to kind of inform everybody that we'll go we'll come back to this later, but this biceps is right in the area of the subscap, and they we really need to talk about the pathology of the two uh, uh, at the same time. Go yeah. ahead. So we have a 50-year-old male with pain radiating, radiating down the arm for five months after trip and fall, rule out, rotate, hit or cuff, tear. Uh, I think the super looks pretty good, but there is some adjacent high signal on the PD fat set imaging. And? Uh, looks like it's probably the subacromial bursa, subdeltoid bursa. That's through there. Okay, so here are the sagittal images. Uh, yeah, it looks like again, there's that's there, yeah, that's this is in the deltoid, deltoid strain. So that's a deltoid strain. Uh, fortunately, the deltoid is not abnormal except for f f uh, fat replacement and a lot of people, but it is important to always look at it because it is such an important muscle that when you see pathology in it, you don't want to miss it. And it's pathology is not common, so it's easy just to pass over it. Okay, so we have coronal and axial views. Um, there's increased uh, signal throughout the muscle there. Which muscle? Uh, it looks like... So on the axial, is that the, the deltoid? Right. So this is another deltoid tear. Hmm. All right. We look like we're mid-heron diaphysis. Um, and there's a tear of some muscle. <laughs> I'm guessing either lat dorsi or uh, triceps. Yeah, this is the teres major. Teres major, okay. So, uh, so the, in this area, you got the latissimus dorsi, the teres major, and the triceps. And uh, sometimes, uh, well, not infrequently when I see pathology in this area, I, I look it up in, in the in the anatomy textbooks just to make sure which muscle. Uh, but we'll see some more of these, and we'll go through. Uh, some of the different muscles uh, anatomy. I think you get better images today, don't you, John? Yes, we do. Yep, these are kind of noisy. So I think this is from England. They water ski in England. Why don't I have the name of the person? I don't know. I apologize to whoever I stole this from and didn't put their name on here. So again, we see some edema and I think a loose tendon there uh, on the right image posteriorly uh yeah the edema around the teres major could be another teres major tear yeah that, this would happen to be latissimus dorsi and i oh. think i've got either here or, or at some point i've got slides showing the anatomy here but right now that's the latissimus dorsi that's a as, as you probably have heard uh Yours truly really thinks a lot about this muscle. Yeah. I'm working on it, John. All right. Uh, kind of looking in that same region, it looks like there's a tear of the, was it Terry's Major? That dorsa? And we we'll should come down through here. Okay. And, you know, again, we, we have limited cuts here, so it would be easier to determine it if we had kind of all, all the images. We see probably a pair of, 
paralabral cyst posteriorly here, so the body posterior labral tear, the patient's probably a weightlifter, mm -hmm. which causes the posterior labral tear, and then during weightlifting tore uh, this muscle, which looks like it's coming down. Uh, and now the, as I'll show it, some lecture, the attachment site of the latissimus dorsi and teres majors are right next to each other on the humerus, and they are posterior to the biceps, whereas the pectoralis major attaches in a similar location, but anterior to the biceps, I'll show at some point. And this is actually a tear of the two of the two muscles here. Yeah, oh, here we go. So here's the, here's the teres major coming across here. That's its attachment to the, to the humerus here approximately in that location. Uh, yeah, so th this is a, a six, 16 year old female who were a lot labral tear, but here we can see another muscle tear back here, uh, more posteriorly located. And this is the long head of the biceps. Posteriorly here, the teres major is anterior in this location. So uh, I'm still not real comfortable at uh, seeing these because we see injuries here all the time. So I usually just. Uh, look at the anatomy online just to, to make sure I get the muscles right uh, when I dictate these. Here's a sagittal image in this particular patient. Then we have this particular muscle coming up here and attaching inferiorly, which is often a nice, and that's the, the triceps, uh, uh, one of the other insertions of the triceps there. Okay. And then there we can see the, the edema, and that's the edema in the long head of the triceps with strain. And then the teres major muscle, we have the triceps coming here. Uh, this is looking at it from posteriorly, triceps, uh, teres major coming across here. Uh, and the latissimus dorsi comes down underneath here. Uh, and, and the latissimus dorsi attaches here to the humerus and it comes down and has a very broad attachment to the uh, thoracic spine, and even the uh, uh, the uh, the pelvic bone here, and here we can see the pec major attachment here, the latissimus dorsi, and the teres major all uh, attaching to the proximal humerus in this location. And uh, when we talk about pectoralis major tears, which are much more common uh, than these, then you really look for the pec major tended to go over the biceps, and we'll talk about that and show some tears there. And so the biceps is a very important uh, help in looking at the anatomy of, of these tendons. And the pec major tendon tear is quite common. The latissimus dorsi and teres major are usually muscle tears. Uh, see, and then here again, we can see a, another muscle tear here. There's a muscle going a little bit more horizontal in location. Uh, then some of the others, the latissimus dorsi tends to go more superior, inferior. But here we can see edema anteriorly here, posterior to the biceps insertion. Uh, so this, we're worried about latissimus dorsi and anteriors major. Uh, this is kind of vertical coming down here. We can see those two areas of edema. And there, and this was, this turned out to be a teres major strain, which came across here more horizontally. And if you go farther down, you can follow the latissimus dorsi. But most of our images of the shoulder don't go down far enough to really see the latissimus dorsi muscle very well. Um, see, actually, I don't think we have time to get through all this. Why don't we stop here, and we'll finish up the. Well, this really isn't rotator cuff anymore, but but that lecture on uh, Thursday, and then we'll move on to. The next lecture, which I think is going to be the biceps. Okay. Okay. See you all in a couple of days, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you.